Welcome everyone once again. Thank you for joining us uh, for this session. This session looks at an intervention that was implemented at Stellenbosch Municipality. Our, our presenter, Sally Maider, was a solid waste manager at the time. And the webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. What happened? Welcome everyone once again. Thank you for joining us um, for this session. This session looks at an intervention that was in Sorry for that. Um, this session looks at an intervention that was implemented at Stellenbosch Municipality. Salim Haider, who was the solid waste manager at the time, is the secular economy project man pro program manager at Green Cape. And his role is to drive Green Cape's circular economy strategy, along with the design and management of programs that contribute to this. His background includes a BSc honors in material science and engineering from the University of Cape Town and a BCom in business management and economics from UNISA. Uh, he has accumulated over 21 years of experience. And I will hand over to him to give us an overview of the project that he ran at Stellenbosch Municipality and uh, the reasons why uh, the, the reasons around why the project did not, did not succeed as expected. Thanks. Thanks, Salim. Over to you. Thank you, Tawanda. And um, yeah, thank you to everyone else that's on this platform. Um, yeah, today I'm just going to talk about learning from failure um, and, and just, you know, when you're a municipal official, you at times think that you've got all the solutions and it's just a matter of implementing them and um, hey presto, it will come right. But that's not always the case and I think, um, you know, there's a lot of nose tweaking that, that has happened in the process and I thought it'd be a good platform to just share that. Next slide, please. So just to indicate, uh, Stellenbosch Municipality has got uh, three large informal settlements. Um, that's Enkanini Kayamandi, uh, which is close to the sort of Stellenbosch um, uh, town itself. And then there's uh, Langrach in Franschuk, as well as uh, Mandela City in uh, Klapmitz. So keeping these areas clean has always been a, a huge challenge. And it, there's always no period of time that would pass when councillors would uh, come to you and request uh, more skips uh, to the areas to service the communities. They always saw skips as the, um, you know, the actual solution to, to, to keeping a town clean. And that, that's never been the case. Next slide, please. So skips have always been unsuccessful for various reasons, and that would be a, there's either lack of space to place them, uh, there's inaccessibility for the cleaning crew to, to come and access them. And um, most of the waste taken to the skip are by women and children uh, within the community. And they don't always manage to actually lift it high enough to actually get it into the skip. So most of the times you actually find a lot of the waste around the skip rather than in it. Skips are also often too small in terms of the volumes that's actually generated or brought to the actual area. And that's that's another problem that ends up with uh, more waste around the skip than in the skip at, at times, if not, if it's too full. Next slide, please. So the next two slides actually just shows the display of the untidy areas, uh, despite having the skip in place. Um, it just doesn't look good enough. It's uh, even the skip itself uh, can look quite tardy and tacky. And um, it's just not the sort of thing that you want to show or yeah, for, for, for an area to actually have, uh, despite there being a collection, albeit a rudimentary collection system in place. Next slide, please. I was then made aware of the Molox, which is actually a product from Finland. Um, which is actually also a waste container. But the difference here is that two thirds of this Moloch is actually underground and only one third protrudes uh, to the top. Molochs are typically uh, five cubic meters or it can take on 5,000 liters in volume. And that's the equivalent of about 21 wheelie bins that can fit inside. Skips would range between uh, four to six cubic meters. You can get bigger skips, but again, Within these areas, it's very difficult to put very large skips in place as well. 
um, you may see three uh, Molochs in the picture. Stellenbosch actually went ahead to, to purchase four to use it as trials within the informal sector. Next slide, please. So as you can see in the picture, it looks pretty easy. It looks extremely neat and it seems like it's, it's, it's a cinch. Um, women, children, doesn't matter. It's, it's a very simplistic system. It's neat, it's well contained and it should typically work and definitely a, a, a big improvement on the way skips would actually look within within the area. Just picture a skip standing at that very same spot. Um, we then decided to, to, to introduce four Molochs in the uh, informal areas and two was placed in the Kayamandi and Kanini uh, region. One was at uh, Langruch, which was actually going to service the genius of space uh, model and then one in uh, uh, Mandela City in Klopnitz as well. Now, as you can see in this picture, Despite um, putting someone, uh, and we had at the time a youth jobs in waste program that was running, um, where we had people uh, employed through uh, grants given by national government to actually assist in waste uh, programs. We had them actually stationed at these Molochs in the first few weeks, just to make people aware of how to use it, what it's there for, and, and what it entails. And uh, yeah, when, when we came back in the in the day, and, and obviously they couldn't stay there overnight or through the night, um, we would often be greeted with this sort of site. Nothing from what the previous pictures had shown. Um, one of the key things that I thought was also worth uh, mentioning was that Molochs was also skeptically received uh, by some members of the community as they thought these were actually surveillance devices that was there to spy on movement or to look at, um, yeah, just what was happening within the area. They didn't actually understand it to be a waste uh, collection system at times. Next slide, please. So I was called by the councillor of Mandela City in Klapnitz to, to have a look at the problem that they, they've encountered. There's actually um, informal settlements that's come up and um, all the waste which is scattered on the ground. And um, again, she asked for, for more skips to be placed there. And I thought, well, we've just sort of purchased these Molochs. This is an ideal site that we could actually put the Molochs down. And I'm sure it will just um, greatly benefit the area. Next slide, please. Yeah, so after doing a bit of clearing and taking all the sort of um, waste away, this Moloch was then uh, put in place. And um, as you can see, um, yeah, once all the clearing had been done, it actually didn't take up that much space. It was fine and um, we could actually go ahead with it. Next slide, please. Yeah, alas, um, it didn't take too long. I think it wasn't even there for more than a week when it was uh, completely burnt out. And um, a day or two later, we've actually found uh, further shacks being uh, put on. And um, yeah, so there was just total encroachment and um, the, the solution to the waste problem that also disappeared with it as well. Um, I can also add that the Moloch in Langrug, whilst it was still standing, it was also vandalized and I'll show a picture of that just now. Um, but both the Molochs in Kaimandi uh, in Kanini were then also subsequently destroyed in very much uh, similar sort of circumstances, albeit over just a longer period of time. Next slide, please. So yeah, one of the sort of key lessons learned was that it's, it's just extremely difficult to just accept and assume that whatever happens in the first world will suddenly happen in, in our environment as well. And there you can see typically what the Moloch of um, the one that was put in Langruk actually looks like. Um, yeah, slowly started being uh, chipped away, eroded away. People started taking the sort of trimmings off and uh, used it uh, for own use. Um, and although this one was actually very much in place because it was part of a genius of space project, um, so it was a little bit more, um, let's say, um, uh, yeah, used used for a specific purpose. And the people on the project actually uh, sort of ensured that only their waste went into it. It didn't really solve the actual problem of waste within that region as well. So next slide, please. So yeah, although we tried the Molochs and we had these sort of high hopes that it could actually sort out the sort of problems that's in the areas, um, it just meant that 
that was not really the solution. And um, this is typically what would happen if you don't take care of the waste stream. Um, and even these sort of structures that were built, and these are the sort of temporary concrete um, bays that that's that's or drop of bays that's there didn't really do anything to help or make the situation any neater or nicer that's there and uh, typically uh, if you just go to the next slide what we needed to do was actually you just needed to go back to basics um, or, or at least before i come to that maybe just to indicate some of the sort of big problems that even our cleaning crew had at the time um, inaccessibility, you actually needed to navigate between the sort of structures that's there. Um, as you can see, the sort of structures are built right onto the edge of the uh, road reserve. Um, there's no space to even put any sort of skips or any other sort of, uh, uh, sort of containers um, in the area, so it just gets dumped onto the pavement. Um, there's a lot of sort of illegal connections that's there and you can see that it's extremely difficult for our waste trucks to even pass by because it needed to be lifted or disconnected so they can pass through to be able to access the area before de delivering the service. Next slide please. So in terms of um, servicing the area we just decided to go back to basics and just use the basics uh, tools of the trade and that would be use your shovels use your spades use your black bags your brooms uh, brakes etc to be able to to actually uh, clean the areas and a lot of the epwps were then uh, brought on board to, to assist and help with it and um, this is basically yeah you know, how the area needed to be to be kept clean so when I had a um, session with the with the communities, I just went in there and I asked them, you know, what was the problem? Why is it that this didn't quite work? And um, the feedback was that the problem was not that the Molochs didn't work. The problem was you, uh, Mr. Hayder. You are the problem. And I couldn't understand it. And I said, but all I'm trying to do is assist, um, try to bring you actually very nice sort of technology to, to, to bring to the fore to be able to make the places look neater and nicer. And it seemed like it was just not accepted. And I said, well, that is the first problem because you came to us with a solution without engaging with us up front um, to ask what it is that we want, to really want us to tell you what the, the issue and what the problem is and what we thought would be a better solution. So by government just putting structures down, we see it that it doesn't come from the community. And if we want to vent our frustration against government or against systems, we take our frustrations out on what government has put down. And um, that's why your Molochs was just one of the sort of key, key targets that we had to, 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 to attack. And um, that's why it's not there anymore. So clearly, um, yeah, if you bring anything into, into the communities, uh, best would always be to engage up front, make sure that there's proper buy-in, make sure there's proper understanding, and um, let them decide what it is that they want, whether they want it, if they say this is not what we want, don't put it down um, and, and rather work on some other sort of system. And now I'd like to move on to the next one. If I just could move to the next slide, please. Here we had flats. Um, these are the municipal flats um, that was there for, you know, it's, it's very low uh, social income sort of flats that's, that's, that's there and they are sort of, there were three sets of them. And we had a huge problem with wheelie bins that, that kept getting stolen. Um, and again, these sort of flats needed the equivalent of 70 uh, wheelie bins uh, to service the sort of units that were there. And I think it was a weekly phenomenon where these constantly got nicked. The communities were too scared to um, really say um, who's taking it. We tried chaining it. Um, the chains got stolen because of that high metal value. Um, so yeah, everything that was tried to just secure the um, the bins didn't quite work. And um, I was then approached to ask, um, how about dropping a Moloch down here? And I thought, just we're not going to go through this sort of uh, road again. But okay, let's let's give it an attempt. But we're going to do it differently this time. I'm actually going to take the learnings from the last sort of um, experience we had. And we're going to engage with every single member of the uh, structures that's there, um, call them in, and this was in conjunction with our housing department um, at the offices. So four consult 
so consultation sessions were held where I firstly presented what a Moloch is, what it does, why it's there, um, how it's going to be emptied. And, and to empty a Moloch, I didn't get into that earlier. It actually takes two minutes um, for a truck to come around uh, and just remove the bag, drop it at the back of a waste truck and put it back again. So it's a, it's a very quick, simple and easy uh, solution to, to empty and, and return. And um, we actually brought them in and after I'd done the first one, another colleague of mine did the second one and the housing department then continued with the last two sort of sessions on their own in terms of just again explaining and bringing this to, to the fore. And the question was asked to the communities whether this is really what they wanted, do they feel this is um, what they needed? And um, at the end of it, after getting a good understanding, posing the questions and feeling that, yeah, they, they were part and party to the actual process that were there, decided that they wanted the Moloch. It would be better than having a, a wheelie bin that's continually stolen. Um, skips just lying there would just attract um, other sort of problems. And because it's open, it's not the sort of best solution that's there. And uh, they actually then bought into, into taking the Moloch. And again, with trepidation, they decided, let's give it a try second time around. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what it looked like at the at the municipal flats, and this is the one just outside the uh, Falaria sort of flats that's there. And um, lo and behold, we had a completely different sort of outcome. Um, it was successfully implemented. Uh, the people bought into it. They placed the the waste not on the outside; it all landed up on the inside of the of the Moloch, and the, that's what the actual middle pictures show. And um, yeah, it was uh, definitely a, a, a much better sort of outcome compared to the, the first one we had. We had one further challenge though, um, that I do need to mention, and I just couldn't find the picture, but um, we still had someone that actually uh, crawled in there and um, yeah, uh, tried to still find uh, items of value within the Moloch. It's supposed to be uh, human friendly, but yeah, I think uh, in our environment, um, anything is possible. Thanks. I think that's uh, that's really what I wanted to bring to the fore, and I'm I'm happy to take any questions uh, from here on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salim. Uh, that that is actually very. It, 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 it is very interesting for touch on in the earlier presentation as well in terms of uh, public behaviors and uh, people throwing waste around rash uh, dustbins when the dustbins themselves are actually empty. Uh, the first question that I have uh, from the participants is public participation is mandated during the course of any municipal project. So in your experience, how successful have these programs been? And what are your thoughts on encouraging a wider? Sorry, Tawanda, I just lost the um, the second part of your question. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Tawanda? Sorry, I'm, I'm not, I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing you. There we go. Sorry, I, yeah. I missed the second part of your question. Did you get the question? No, I missed the second part of your question. Okay, so I'll just repeat it again. So public participation is mandated during the course of any municipal project development. So in your experience, how successful have these programs been? Um, I don't know if that's to get a percentage or maybe uh, examples. And what are your thoughts on encouraging a wider public participation? Yeah, um, the difficulty is always timing of public participation programs. Um, if you go with intended public participation, you always try and set it up um, and you think, um, let's let's do it when most of the people, and here we're looking at, let's say, the formal sort of sector, when they're at home, then you can actually do it at um, in the evenings um, after people have returned from work. 
And we often found that those were not very well attended. Um, people are actually tired. They've just had a long day. And uh, sometimes the issue would be, uh, well, it all depends on what the municipality wants to tell us now and what they want to do. Sometimes it's just do what you need to do and just carry on. But for us to give up our time to sit at public participation meetings, you don't always get the sort of um, participation that you expect. Um, so public participation is not always uh, that successful. What we found that if you do most of it during the day, you do attract a, a bigger sort of audience, but it would be those that would be more from the sort of uh, lower economic sector, those that's unemployed, um, those that, yeah, they, they, they're really wanting to see an improvement and they want to raise their voices so that uh, the municipality can hear and can listen. Um, but key to all of it is you cannot ignore public participation. You've got to do it. Um, you've got to be, you, you've got to watch, you've got to monitor, you've got to learn, you've got to tweak, you've got to keep at it all the time. And even if it means doing more over um, more sort of periods of time, if that's what's needed, that's what needs to be done. Um, can, can be quite costly, but I think the bottom line is you need the buy-in and it needs to be done properly. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, so just touching on that, a follow-up from my side maybe is, uh, maybe can you elaborate a little bit on, on the sort of public participation process that happens? And I'm sure a lot of people are not aware of, of the avenues that the municipalities uh, go through. So you mentioned the meetings, which is just one of the things that happens. And I'm just taking from the poll that 67% of the respondents indicated that they, they are not aware of public participation processes. Um, so maybe if you just you could give us a two minute brief on that. Yeah. Um... As I mentioned, it's 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 sort of ingrained within any sort of uh, community that you you do not just go in and implement anything. You uh, because a you public participation, as you mentioned earlier, is actually mandatory. Mandatory where you actually ta you've taken the sort of public's money and you want to implement infrastructure or goods and services as as such within these sort of communities, and that's why they are platforms that you've got to go through. Um, first of all, a lot of these sort of wards or sectors have got ward councillors that's there to represent the community. It becomes a little bit more difficult if the community don't really see the ward councillor as their main representative and they sometimes have their own sort of representatives that's there as well. So you've got these sort of uh, politicking that, that takes place uh, that you've got to navigate through too. Um, but yeah, they, you, you need to be able to speak to the community leaders that's there. And, and these need to be people that's um, accepted by the community, um, that's not going to be seen as antagonistic. And um, you need to give thorough explanation. You've got to indicate where the sort of funding is going, what the funding entails, what the services entail. And I think that the, the services is really the thing that everybody wants. Uh, nobody wants a sort of dirty environment. And um, it's it's quite important to have these sort of engagement sessions. Um, and quite often, if you just decide to do one thing and the councillor is unaware of it, um, you do get a backlash um, from the administration side. So there are sort of processes in place um, within the organisation or within the municipality uh, platforms where you need to, to bring this to the fore so that uh, you don't catch anyone by surprise, even with the best of intentions. But um, and ideally, you work um, through the committees, through the through your councillors, through your uh, community liaison officers that may be there, um, so that the community also has a voice in terms of what it is you want. They may not like what you're bringing, and they've got the right to actually tell you not to do it. And uh, yeah, these are just some of the the sort of avenues that's that's there. You've actually just highlighted uh, the kind of trajectory ways that's gone through, where, where we start from a very um, physical aspect. So looking at landfilling of waste, and then uh, we move to a kind of waste diversion. And now when you're looking at the full circular economy, you really have to look at the full value chain and the role of um, the role of the community, the role of the public, and 
that's really a very important aspect that was not as important uh, a few years ago when, when the core job was uh, collecting the waste and putting it in a landfill. And uh, maybe just a comment from your side on uh, on a comment that was published or that was added that uh, your presentation highlights that we need more social scientists working in waste management. Um, I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, most most definitely. Um, waste is um, waste is really one of those areas that cover both economic social and environmental, all three actually, um, economic, social, environmental issues. And you cannot really put the one higher than the other. And um, they all need to be in the right sort of balance. Um, and it's quite important that that social element that is there is not sort of uh, downplayed, neglected in any way, so that um, yeah, you, you you ensure that you actually get that, and, and and a lot of the hard work is actually in that sort of uh, sector or space that that needs to come through. Because again, and 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 we'll see uh, another presentation on human behaviour shortly. Um, that is the more difficult sort of area to to change and for people to to get the sort of buy-in. And um, quite often you're dealing with people that are struggling. Um, they're really on the bottom ledge of Maslow's sort of uh, hierarchy and survival is their, their main sort of um, issue. Um, if you look at environmental issues, um, that's not really of uh, a massive concern if you, if you don't have uh, bread to put in your mouth or feed your kids or, or just about uh, get through with what, what needs to be done. So, yeah, one needs to sort of bear all of this into consideration in terms of uh, putting out any sort of systems and structures. And it's so important to get that sort of triad of environment, social and economic well balanced so that um, yeah, you, 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 you make the difference within, within these sort of sectors. And, and you're quite right, you need to understand the people and um, yeah, the social and, and, and the sort of, um, yeah, let, let's, let's call it social scientists that's, that's needed within this space is, is, is so important and um, you cannot do without it. Thank you, Salim. And I think we'll, we'll just uh, have time for one more question. Uh, and I think this really is a very important point, looking at how a lot of municipalities are going to this space. We've, we recently, uh, not very recently, there's been a strong drive towards recycling and waste diversion from landfill, and now we're shifting towards the circular economy. So a lot of projects have been tried and tested, and I do like um, the way you showed that you tried Moloch the first time, they didn't work, and then you went and you tried a second time. So often you see municipalities not taking on projects because they know that a certain municipality has failed. Uh, but a, a question has, has been raised that is there a need to create a platform where municipalities can share examples of what they tried, uh, what has worked, and what the reasons for for the successes and what has failed and what the reason for failure is. Because often you may discard a, a project because you think um, it's failed, so it's not going to work in your case as well. Yeah, I think I think the classic example I could raise uh, also at my time at, at Stellenbosch was the actual, we, we wanted to incentivize the um, collection of material because again, if there's, if there's no incentive for, for, for someone, they're not going to do it. They would expect uh, government to go and do the cleanups. Um, it's not it's not our job to go and clean up the area. But as I've indicated, sometimes these the waste are, are, are very difficult to to pick up. You you've got inaccessibility issues, and you've got to think a little bit out of the box to be able to to get to what is there. Um, and we decided to 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 work on these sort of swap shop models, and um, we we try to implement it in all three um, informal areas. Um, and it was actually initially only successful in, in the one, uh, and that was actually in Klopnitz. So people embraced it, people loved it, they uh, got rewards, well they got tokens which they could then exchange for, for basic household goods and necessities, again the Maslow issues come to the fore. And um, it worked so well that it, where we started off with uh, 280 kilograms on day one, a year later we used to collect up to three tons of, of waste. And we're talking about recyclable waste 
that was actually previously just uh, dumped in the area. So it also had a knock-on effect on the on the area itself. The area was a lot cleaner, neater, nicer, and um, you didn't need to really go in and clean up the area. However, when we looked at um, the Kayamandi sort of uh, model, um, they we had a different reaction. People looked at us and you know turned up their noses and said, "But we don't want." Uh, donations and second-hand clothing and, and whatever you're giving for, for what we want to bring to the fore, we don't want to partake in this. Um, when we did the same thing in the Langrach community, um, people came to the stall, um, what is it? You've, oh, you've got goods. We need to work for it. No, we don't want to work for it. Let's just raid your store. And there was a, a huge raid on the store and everybody had to pick up and run. So again, you had three completely different sort of um, outcomes for a similar concept that you wanted to introduce. But we said we'll focus only on the positive. Let's close the other two down and let the councillor actually indicate the success in, in her area. And that then spread within the council chambers to the other councillors. And then they called us again to say, why don't you implement this in our areas? And they said, we will, but let's just do a public participation process first. We'll go there with a the loud hailer. We'll have a translator, we'll explain what the model is all about and then redo it again. And when we did, did it in that way, uh, it was a lot more successful than the first run that, that we had. Not as successful as, as Clubman's itself, I think it got well ingrained there, but uh, still better than our, yeah, our previous or initial sort of attempts that, that we had. Okay. So, so, so just a quick one, do you know of any platforms? Uh, platforms that uh, so can be raised. Uh, so, yeah. Solga uh, also has platforms where they raise this, and also from provincial side, they've got the Waste Management Officers Forum that, that's also there. Okay. I think, um, thank you very much, Salim. Uh, again, that was another very insightful presentation, and you really touched on, uh, on, on what the next presentation is about. Uh, trying to understand the behaviors and the perceptions that drive uh, that drive people. So please join us in 15 minutes for the next presentation on behaviors and perceptions around waste management. Thank you very much, Salim, and thank you everyone for attending. You're welcome. Thanks.